scripture reading of God's Word today is in Luke 24, 45 through 49. <clears throat> then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send to you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. So be it. If you don't know it, I've got one today. It's a lot easier than four, so I should look a little rested. How would I know? Because I watch you take care of him. How's that? And that's exhausting, let me tell you. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we have a warm place to go. Lord, we thank you for this snow, and Lord, we pray for those that have been belted with snow so much more than we have, Lord, and those that um, have needs of heat and other things right now. Lord, we are so blessed, but not blessed because we're taken care of, but blessed because we're in a right standing with you, that we know you because we know Jesus. Lord, fill us with your spirit today that we may be more and more like Christ that we hear your words and obey them, Lord. Put them into practice so that we can be the holy people that you have called us to be, that we can be a light to this world, that we can show others the love that you have for them through Jesus Christ. Equip us today, Lord, each and every day to, to walk this walk until Jesus Christ returns. Lord, we thank you for the hope that we have, that we know confidently that Jesus Christ will return and that he will claim us as his own. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I hope you're reading along in your Psalms, um, and hopefully you're reading um, in one of the uh, plans or your own plan. For you that don't know it, if you weren't here, I think we put them on the back, Debbie, is that not correct? The plans? Yes. They're back there. There's a reading plan to read through the Bible in a year, uh, chronologically. There's a reading plan that's called a five-day plan, where you read five days of the week, and then on the weekend you study and contemplate about what you read and so forth. And I've got that plan back there where we started in Matthew. So if you've been reading along in Matthew, you're to Matthew chapter 5, which begins um, the Sermon on the Mount. And I will look at that some today and tie that in with where we're at in Acts. If you didn't get one either, Sherry, show them the little stone Everybody should have a devotional that you're following along in Psalms, and I got a brick, whatever you want to call it, um, so that you can put it in your house also to tell you to stand firm in your reading and in your walk with Jesus Christ. So if you don't have one of those, I still have some of those. I think everyone got um, the Psalms reading. If you didn't, please come see me. I might have a copy still around. If I don't, I will get one. And you should be on whatever today is. I believe it's January 8th, correct? As we're walking through the Psalms. 9th? Okay, see, I'm off. I haven't read today's yet. I have. You can ask me. I told you to do that to hold me accountable. I have read through yesterday with it, and I am up into Matthew. In fact, I'm a couple days ahead because I kept reading through the complete Sermon on the Mount, and we'll talk more about that today. I entitled this... The message of forgiveness. And I'm going to paint a picture for you today. And I tell you that because you may not agree with me how I'm going to paint this picture. I don't ever want to do scripture where I'm trying to paint a picture for you and not tell you that. Because I'm going to paint a picture for you of why Philip went to Samaria and not Peter. Okay, maybe you read through that and didn't even pay attention to that. But in my opinion, Peter didn't go because he didn't know the message of forgiveness. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Have you ever been angry at someone? Of course. Enough that you held a grudge? Uh, more than likely. Okay, has it ever caused you to avoid that person or have anger or hatred in your heart? 
And I know where you think you know where I'm headed with the Sermon on the Mount, then you've sinned. Period. So as you're reading the Sermon on the Mount today, or not today, tomorrow, if you're reading that plan, you'll go into Matthew chapter 6. Think about Jesus' words. He's into his three-year ministry. He's well into it, and crowds are gathered all around. And he sits down, and he says, Blessed are you, and he turns their world upside down. Because the things that he says that you're blessed at are not things that you think of a blessing. And if you remember from when I talked about it at Christmas about Mary being blessed, there's several words for blessed, but the biggest word, it, it culminates up to this, is that you're blessed because of your right standing with God. And that's where it all leads up to. But you know the Bible says this. It says, don't let the sun set upon your anger, right? And I can give you many other Bible verses. John later will go on to write that you can't love God if you don't love your brother. He calls you a liar. It says the truth is not in you. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says this, and we know where Paul's at in chapter 8. Saul is persecuting the church. He's persecuting the church, going from house to house, driving them out and imprisoning them. Imprisoning them. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to 32, I'm not going to preach on it, I'm just going to read through it. So I tell you this and insist on it, on it in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, and the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. A progressive problem that was in Israel all throughout the Old Testament, a problem that's still in the church in the New Testament here, a problem that's still in our lives today. And Stephen warns, he says, you stick, stiff-necked people, your hearts are hardened. And he tells them to not resist the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Verse 19, having lost all sense of shame, they have given themselves over to sen sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with a craving for more. But this is not the way that you came to know Christ. Surely you have heard of Him and were taught in Him, in keeping with the truth that is in Jesus. To put off your former way of life, your old self, which is being corrupted by its evil desires. To be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off all falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are all members of one another. Be angry... Yet do not sin. Don't let the sun set upon your anger. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing good with his own hands, that he may have something to share with one in need. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up the one in need and bringing grace to those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption." Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, outcry and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and tender-hearted to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. Now those words come from Paul, who is persecuting the church at this point. And he real, he, when he changes, he realizes the love of Christ in his heart, the love of God, that he cannot not forgive others. Did you hear me? Because <laughs> all of you shook your head when I said, said what, asked those questions earlier, that he cannot not forgive others. And look at that example of Stephen, how he never tried to, to justify himself or anything. He thought about their salvation, and as they were stoning him, he cried out and said, forgive them. What kind of love but to have a love like Christ in your heart? Paul also wrote in Colossians 3, verses 1 to 17. Therefore, since you have been raised with Christ, strive for the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on er earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, the components of your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. When you lived among them, you, you also, 
used to walk in these ways. But now you must put aside all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from, our, from your lips. Do not lie to one another since you have taken off the old self with its practices and to put on a new self which is being renewed in knowledge and image of its creator. Here there is no Jew, no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythic, slave or free, or Samaritan. I'm adding that in there so you know that. But Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, the, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with hearts of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive any complaint you may have against someone else. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which is the bond of perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, for to this... For to this you were called as members of one body, and be thankful. Let the words of Christ richly dwell within you as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do it, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now these are words written to two churches well after Acts 8. To give you a time frame... We don't know exactly, but if we're just going to put dates, I'm going to throw them out there. Pentecost happened in the year A.D. 30. That may or may not be exactly right. At least a year to possibly five years has happened. We see that the church is being persecuted more and more. They pray for boldness. They share things together. They're set. Their hearts are set. Their minds are set. And their bodies are set on fulfilling the Great Commission. But they're stuck in Jerusalem, aren't they? What's the Great Commission say? Okay? All right. And we've read, and I told you last week, that 8 1 is kind of the anti Acts 8 1 is kind of the anti verse to Acts 1 8 because it's persecution that Jesus uses to drive the church out of Jerusalem for whatever reasons, whether they were complacent, whether they didn't think about it, or maybe, 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 just maybe. Okay? I'm painting that picture. There was no way they wanted to go to Samaria to their half-breed brothers. The ones that 700 and something years ago intermarried with the Assyrians. And they worship differently. They worship on a different mountain. Everything else to the point now, you don't even walk through Samaria to go to Galilee. You walk around. But you remember John chapter 4, right, where Jesus went to Samaria to, he had to go there. He, he was set resolutely to go there. You might also remember when Jesus was resolutely set to go to Jerusalem and went through Samaria. Well, when he went through Samaria in John chapter 4, the disciples said, why is he talking to this woman? They didn't see the need because they felt like the Samaritans were their trash half-brothers. They did not fellowship with them. How can you know the love of Jesus and have that in your heart? And we see hypocrisy in the Pharisees, and, and we see that, but do we see our own hypocrisy? When we read those two sets of scriptures that I read, we can sit there and say, yeah, I don't do those things, but do you do the other things that are mentioned in them? Anger was mentioned in both of them. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath was mentioned. To have a new self where most of all the biggest virtue you can put on after you forgive someone is love. And you remember when Peter asked how many times he was supposed to forgive? Do we do that? Or do we pick and choose the things that we do well or we don't have a problem with? Because that love your enemy stuff is tough, ain't it, Merle? It's tough, but it's scriptural. And unless you learn, know to, learn, to love your enemy, how can you be like Stephen who was like Christ? And we have the example, example of a layperson, one of the seven chosen, because there's a grievance in the church again. Our people aren't getting taken care of as good as your people. Greek versus Jew. They bo they're both have come to, to the salvation of Jesus Christ, but they're not filthy, nasty Samaritans. So we have a little, little problem there between the Greek and the Jew, but we don't have a problem between the, the Jew and the Samaritan because we're not going to deal with the Samaritans at all. You see the picture that I'm painting? Do you see where I am painting it from from Scripture? I mean, we see Peter being the rock, 
But I don't know why the apostles weren't driven from Jerusalem. I know that also tells me undoubtedly that the Great Commission is not just for the 12 or the 120. It's for everyone. That as we go along, we're to preach wherever we're at the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have to live holy lives or we're nothing but hypocrites. The message will still be the same. People will still come by the power of God to salvation. But you might stand there that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do mighty miracles in your name? And he might say, depart from me, I do not know you. How is your heart? Because if you have a new heart, God's laws are written on it. And you might need some pushing here or there, but God's laws are written on your heart. And it may take a Philip or it may take a Stephen to tell a Peter, hey, get rid of that animosity in your heart. Acts 8, verse 4 to 13 is where we're going to cover today. And we're going to cover some other things also. So I'm going to read that part. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. That's where we stopped last week. Philip, he's our example here. Second example out of the seven men that were picked to do the food distribution in Acts chapter 5. Philip went down to a city in Samaria, and he proclaimed the Christ to them. The crowds gave their undivided attention to Philip's message and to the signs that they saw him perform. Oh, yeah. He's one of the lay people, a Greek believer, and he's performing these signs, these great signs that the Holy Spirit gave him the power to do because the Holy Spirit has come upon all believers and they have the power to do whatever the Holy Spirit gives them the power to do as he sees the, the gifts that he's going to give them. What you see in Stephen and then you see in Philip is you see a man that loves Jesus and is therefore filled with the power of the Holy Spirit because he's being transformed into the image of Jesus. With loud shrieks, verse 7, unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed, and many of the paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Prior to that time, a man called Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and astounded the people of Samaria. He claimed to, to be someone great, and all the people from the least to the greatest heeded his words and said, This man is the divine power called the great power. They paid close attention to him because he had astounded them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he preached the gospel of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed and was baptized." Now, if your translations are a little different, that's okay. I'm reading from the Berrien Study Bible. It is a newer translation that has a lot of research in it to, to come up with the words that it's come up with. Your translation may not even say sorcery. But if you go back and study that root word, the power that Simon is doing these things is not the power of God, even though he claims it's the power of God. It's another power. So if yours just says magic, that doesn't quite mean the same as sorcery or whatever yours might say. That's why I'd use the Berry and Study of the Bible today. Plus, I gave Cherry one for Christmas, so I'm going with that one. Whatever you do, study God's Word. Study to be an approved workman that can rightly handle the Word of truth. It tells us in this scripture that even Simon comes to believe. Verse 13 says, even Simon himself... Well, where did I stop? 11... Yeah, 12, but when they believed Philip as he preached the gospel of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Verse 13, even Simon himself believed and was baptized. If you study about Simon, and there are several Simons in the Bible, okay? Don't get them confused. Um, if you study about him, <clears throat> church legend has that he came on to be an antichrist for sure. But it says right here that he believed. So some people say, hey, he believed and that's the case. But there are plenty of people that profess today as we're reading a story, I believe this and later believe different. Charles Templeton went with Billy Graham, could have been big, bigger evangelist than Billy Graham, but went to his deathbed denouncing Jesus Christ. Did many come to Christ under him? Yeah. But he himself denounced Jesus Christ on his deathbed. So there was a time where you definitely could have written down that he believed I don't believe Simon. I don't believe again. I'll say that, that, that Simon's faith was genuine. 
And as we read on next week, Peter confronts him. But I want to go back to Matthew for a little bit and read Jesus' words. We read what Paul wrote later. We know he's persecuting the church now in the story. But where we're at, if you read Matthew chapter 5, you read this. You have heard. Okay? You have heard this. And that's part of what we've got to understand. That a lot of things we've heard, there's truth to them, but we've applied non-truth to them too. Okay? And Jesus says that in, the, in his first teaching. He turns it all upside down. You're not to be like the world anymore. You have been given, if you believe in Jesus Christ, new life by the power of God who dwells in you. You are a temple. You are a royal priesthood. You are God's bought with the price, the blood of Jesus Christ. Your life is not your own. And I know you struggle with that because I struggle with that all the time. What does that mean? What am I supposed to do? Well, the disciples gave up everything. But Peter wasn't willing to go to Samaria necessarily. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to, to the ancients, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. We know all that. But, complete opposite here, I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to, to his brother, Raka, which is just... Ugh, I don't want to have anything to do with you, will be subject to the Sanhedrin or the council. But anyone who says, you fool, will be subject to the fires of hell. The Jews treated the Samaritans as they were not worthy of salvation. In some of their prayers, if you study, their prayers were actually to take them out of the resurrection. They hated them that much. Wow. And these are descendants from the 12 tribes of Israel now. <laughs> wow. So if you're offering your gift, because I think I'm in great standing at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, and how can you not when you have that kind of animosity in your heart? Leave your gift, therefore, before the altar. First and go be reconciled to your brother, then and come and offer your gift. Remember? When the religious leader asked Jesus, said, well, who is my brother? And he tells them this story of a good Samaritan that showed so much more than the priest or the Levite did about mercy and grace and love and compassion. Jesus goes on to say in Matthew chapter 5, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you again a complete opposite. Love your enemies. I just harassed Merle. And pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his sun to shine, to rise on the evil and the good, and send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not Gentiles do the same? I wonder if Peter asked himself that when Philip went to see the Samaritans. Or did, Phil, did Peter again not realize that Samaria were people created in God's image, people of the 12 tribes of Israel, people that deserved salvation because we don't deserve salvation just as much as you or I who claim we deserve salvation. There are none righteous, no, not one. No. But thank goodness for God's love and His gift through Jesus Christ. Freely, freely it's given. Freely, freely give it. I know I changed that around a little. but In Matthew 18, Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Up to seven times? Here's Jesus' answer to that question. I tell you not seven times, but 70 times. And he goes on to tell a parable, a further teaching illustration about settling your debts before it's time for you to settle your debt. In Matthew chapter 6, as you read on tomorrow, so then this is how you should pray. Did you forget about that? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this daily bread and forgive us our debts or trespasses as we forgive, or maybe your translation says as we have already forgiven, because it's a continual verb that means all the way, past, present, future. You don't hold anything from behind. You forgive them for everything today and you forgive them for anything that will happen in the future because that's exactly how you have been forgiven. Did you forget that? How could we hold on to the people like that in Samaria? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's like we read in Colossians about not letting the devil have a foothold in your life. Because if there's sin in your heart, the devil's going to grab a hold as quick as he can and make that anger stronger and that hatred stronger to you to where you don't even want to share the gospel message with that person. Verse 14, after the prayer, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Boy, there's the opposite side of the coin told to you. Oh, and now the opposite side of that coin again. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. Now, like I said, I'm painting a picture, but you need that picture painted because of what Samaria meant to Judea. And where's the gospel supposed to spread? And it's been one to five years and it hasn't spread there. And it's not Peter or James or John who is spreading it. It's Philip, one of the seven. Let me get it up here. That was to handle the food program because there was a quarrel in the church already. I just don't know, in my own opinion, if Peter would have gone unless Philip went first. Now, saying that, and I'm saying that personally, I need you guys as examples. I can be just as set in my ways of this and that. I told Debbie and Barry about something like that the other day where I struggled with something, and I want to not do something with this people, person, whatever you want to say, but I don't want to be that way. So I asked them to hold me accountable. I already take it to God and take it daily and everything else, but I don't want anything in me. Search my heart, O Lord, that I may be like Christ. Give me the gift of prophecy and teaching so that I can teach you, but help me not to be a hypocrite so that I can lead by example also, so that I can help lead you to the truth, but also help you to live a life of worth. So even if you are saved, that you don't waste that life, but you bring God glory. His kingdom come, not mine. His will come, not mine. Acts chapter 1, well, Luke 24 first, what Merle read. Then he opened their minds, Merle didn't read that part, to understand scriptures, and he told them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and in his name repentance and forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed to all nations. Beginning, starting in Jerusalem, that's the starting point. You are my witnesses. And I want to remind you of what that word means. It can also be translated martyrs. You are my witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending you the promise of the Father, but remain in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. That's how long they're supposed to remain in Jerusalem. One to five years has happened. Not saying that it's been too long. Not saying that it, it, everything's in God's time. I'm not saying that at all. He is 100% sovereign. But He will use all things to bring Him glory and honor. Acts 1.8 said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That word power reminds you of that. It only equated to the Holy Spirit and it's dynamus, it's dynamite power or gale, first, gale force tempest wind power. Something that nothing can stand up to. So explosive when it happens, it just explodes and you see what's left as a result. And this is the same kind of power that Simon is claiming to the Samaritans because don't forget we fight a spiritual battle. Acts 8, 1, though, says, And Saul was there. Here's the persecution. And we see Saul coming up. We would never dream he's going to later establish churches because now he's persecuting. Saul was there giving approval to Stephen's death. On that single day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. 
God's got a plan. And if I won't do it, He might be calling you to do it. He might be calling you to show me that I'm a hypocrite. We're all one in Christ. We're all sons of God through the Holy Spirit. We're all priests. We are one priesthood, one royal holy temple to bring about salvation to the world. Not that we save, not that we can do anything, but spread the gospel message and live like Christ in this world. And then people will see the hope that we have. Those Acts verse 4 and 5, those who had been scattered preaching the word went every, preaching the word everywhere they went, Philip went down to the city in Samaria and praying, proclaimed Christ to them. John 8, verse 47 and 48. Whoever belongs to God, hears the words of God. These are words of Jesus. The reason you do not hear is that you don't belong to God. See, there's always that issue. There's always goats that think they're sheep. My prayer is that everyone here is a sheep. My prayer again is that everyone here leads a life of worth. Pray to God that He examines your heart. If you need to forgive, forgive. Don't hold any sins, especially the ones that you know of, because you're denying the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. The Jews answered him, Are we not right to say that you are a Samaritan and you have a demon? That's the answer that the Pharisees and religious leaders gave Jesus. They compared him to a Samaritan and said that he had a demon. That's the hatred that they had for their half-brothers. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes you don't realize that because you go down that path so long that you are a bigot and a hypocrite and can't see it. And I'm talking about myself too. So you need to be let God examine your heart. There are none righteous, no, not one. Freely you've been given... Fr Freely give. In Luke 9, verse 51 to 55, I want to remind you that as the day of his ascension approached, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He sent his messengers on ahead of him. He went to a village, into a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him, but the people there refused to welcome him because he was headed for Jerusalem. He had a purpose. It, it was in God's will that they reject him at this time because he had to get to Jerusalem. It was a part of God's plan. But when the disciples saw this, verse 54, James and John, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Do you see the hatred? How many times have you said something about that person? Maybe it wasn't that you wanted to rain down fire, but Jesus is clear that if you have hatred in your heart, you need to get rid of it before it festers and turns into sin and before the devil gets a foothold in your life. Remember what Stephen said in Acts chapter 7, verse 51, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and uncircumcised ears. Do you know what the word Simon means? It's not a Hebrew word. It comes from a Hebrew word. Shema. What's that mean? Hear. Listen, O Israel, hear and obey. If you hear, you've got to obey. They go hand in hand. As a parent, you say, go clean up your room. There is no not go clean up your room. There didn't, I heard you, but I'm not doing it. Love your neighbor. You've heard it say that and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love those and pray for the, your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Do you do that? I'm not very good at that. <clears throat> Verse 55, But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Are you like Jesus? Do you have love in your heart? Are you thankful for the gift that you have been given? Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 reminds us that we're facing a spiritual battle. Paul is closing this chapter out again. This is the one who's persecuting the church now. That's why I'm going backwards and forwards. Finally, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. 
But put on the full armor of God so that you make, can make your stand against the devil's schemes because he is scheming against you, trying to rob God, God of his glory. For, your, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this world's darkness, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. But you, O child of God, son of the Most High, daughter of the King, you have been clothed with power from on high to do mighty miracles, to do greater things than Jesus has done so that you can proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you're not professing Jesus Christ in English, you'll probably never experience tongues of any other language. If you're not praying, how can you feel like you're going to pray for healing for somebody and it come about if your prayer life's not where it's supposed to be? If you have hatred and animosity in your heart for your brother, how can you expect your message to your children and your grandchildren to be heard? So then this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now before I didn't say it because some of your versions have it, some of them don't because there are manuscripts that don't. But this is there in the King James. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. It's a battle of kingdoms. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of hell, the kingdom of myself with me on the throne, or the kingdom with Jesus on the throne. And guess what? If myself's on the throne, Satan's really the one sitting there. I have to remove myself. I have to become less, and Jesus has to become more in my life. And that word there in the King James is dynamus, that power that comes from heaven given to men. It's the power by which you might be saved, but it's also the power that you can live, and it's the power that you will proclaim the message to the world. <clears throat> For if you forgive men of their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses... Neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Now I'm going to speed you on into Tuesday. Matthew chapter 7. I, start, I said it earlier. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Many, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? You know how the Sermon on the Mount ends. He says, the wise man builds his house upon the rock, correct? We're fighting a spiritual battle, and the spiritual battle that we're fighting at this time in the church, we've seen all of these problems come along to destroy the church. Now we've seen persecution, and persecution didn't stop us. But would the anger in my heart towards my half-breed brother stop me from taking the message to the Samaritans? which Jesus clearly said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the rest of the world. Sherry said, stop saying utter. Utter. <laughs> Correct? And it's a battle plan. So would that message have not even went to the rest of the world if I had been unwilling to take it to my Samaritan half-brothers? But see, Philip had no real knowledge of this. He just had Jesus in his heart. And he went into Samaria, and there is a false god there, a false power, through Simon the sorcerer. Simon. Simon, did you catch that? <laughs> Simon, where Jesus changed his name to Cephas, or Peter in Greek, which means rock, which if you study its origin back even further, it means bowed down, low to the ground, connected to the ground. You can't get any lower because you said, not me, God. You've laid out prostrate. Prostrate, I know. I'm playing with you. <laughs> laid out flat on the ground. Correct. <laughs> That's what a rock is. It doesn't move. It's fixed on the ground because it knows who created it. And even the rocks will cry out if we don't. Think of these things. 
I don't think, in my opinion, that Peter would have gone until Jesus showed him his hypocrisy through someone else. But here's what happened in Acts chapter 8. Those who, verse 4, those who had been scattered, that's what caused this, preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to the city of Samaria, or the because that is also the capital city, or the region of Samaria, and proclaimed the Christ to them. The crowds gave their undivided attention because they were looking for the Messiah also. Think back to John chapter 4. They gave their undivided attention to Philip's message and to the signs they saw him perform because he was walking step in step with the Spirit and he performed the miracles. With loud shrieks, unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed. We still fight that spiritual battle. There's still demons out there, the same number there were before, that are trying their best to get you to pledge allegiance to the kingdom of hell. Many came out, many paralyzed and lame were healed, so there was great joy in that city. Prior to that time, though, a man named Simon, who should have heard and obeyed the word of Jesus, but didn't. He's hearing obeying the word of Satan. He had practiced sorcery power from Satan in the city, and that astounded the people of Samaria. He claimed to be someone great, and all the people, from the least to the greatest, heeded his words. So if we wouldn't have went there to that land, we would be guilty of them going to hell, their blood would be on our hands. This man is the divine power called the great power, meaning that he's from God, but he's not. He's a fake. He's an antichrist. They paid close attention to him because he had astounded them for a long time with his sorcery. Another reason that the Spirit gives us abilities and power so that we can compete with the powers and abilities that are from other forces. Verse 12, one of the greatest buts in the Bible again. When they believed Philip as he preached. Boy, I love the Barry and study Bible there. Philip as he preached. No prepared sermon, nothing else, just the love of Jesus in his heart. He hadn't been brought up with the Old Testament forever. He was new to it. But he studied, he heard the words, he hid them in his heart. The Holy Spirit revealed them to him so that he could proclaim the message of Jesus Christ and be like Jesus Christ in this world. But when they believed Philip as he preached the gospel of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed and was baptized. Irony, like I said in that, is that Simon was preaching in Samaria when Simon, who Jesus changed his name to Peter the Rock, building the church in Jerusalem, should have already stepped out to Samaria. So well, I'm stopping there so you know. But my question is, how many people have you not been willing to go to? And don't tell me there's not any that you said, nah, I don't really want to do that. Because then if you do, <clears throat> I'm going to go back to John and say that you're a liar. And I don't normally say that because I know we're all guilty of that. Paul himself says, why do I continue to do the things that I don't do? But John also said, if you sin, you have an advocate in the Father. The reason God gives you His Holy Spirit is A, that you will be a messenger, a witness, a martyr even for Jesus Christ, and B, that you will be like Christ. Not necessarily in that order, but that's what we're to do. Live like Christ and proclaim Jesus Christ. But there are times when I don't really want to proclaim to this or that person. Whether there's a deep-seated ha hatred or anger, or it is, eh, it's not convenient or whatever it is. Father, forgive me. Examine my heart. Help me to realize how precious this gift is, how I don't know how many days that I have before me, and that how every day that I have should be to live for Jesus Christ, to live like Him and to proclaim Him to this world because I might not have a chance to do so tomorrow. Sherry caught me on it yesterday because we got our, son, our grandson with us. And I said, I don't really want to go get him tonight because we were offered to have him. I said, I'd rather go get him tomorrow. She said, but if we get him tonight, he can go to Bible church because that's what he calls it, Bible church. I said, he's too young. She said, how do you know? So I went and got him. <laughs> 
I hope I made a point. I'm not trying to teach you anything that's not there. I don't know why Peter didn't go or anything else, but I know the facts that we can see so I can paint a picture with it. And it makes me, like I said, say, Lord, God, I thank you. I Hallowed is your name. Your kingdom come, not mine. Your will be done, not mine. Father, forgive, help me to be satisfied with what I have, daily bread, and help me to forgive others as you have forgiven me. Boy, that's a, a crazy high standard. Lord, search my heart and help there not to be any evil things there whatsoever. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Transform me. Lord, help me to be like Christ in this world. What does it profit me to gain the whole world? And not necessarily to lose my salvation, but to not have done the job that you set out for me and given me everything in heaven. Jesus' authority and Jesus' power that he walked on this earth. Lord, help me to not take that for granted, but to use that effectively and efficiently for your kingdom. We thank you and praise you, Lord. We thank you for the freedom that we have in this country. And Lord, may we be bold to preach, the, preach Jesus and his resurrection and your grace, no matter what circumstances we're in. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.